morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earth and Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. I've had a few of you ask me uh, about prayer, and in particular, the question that has been asked of late is about when do we stop praying for people? When is it appropriate to pray? What kinds of prayers are appropriate? And, and so I thought to make a video to answer these questions and, and bless many because these are things I think usually if I get a question from two or three people, there's probably a good deal more of you who are wondering the same thing. So we'll go to the Word of God today to, to understand these things and listen to what Jesus Christ has to say about it because my opinion means nothing. But praise the Lord for another day wherein we can speak of his word and dwell in his presence. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. I want to begin in 1 John chapter 5. And this was uh, the, verse, the verses that were initially presented to me when this question was asked the first time. So let's begin here in verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for that, pardon me, give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. What is being spoken of here is that we recognize as saints of the Most High God, that our prayers are answered when we ask according to his will. So when we ask God for something, we must always be dwelling in the word of God and wondering what is his will and not our own will. And this was manifest in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. When he prayed to his Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, asked his Father if it would be possible that the cup of the cross be taken from him. And he prayed this three times, and three times he also prayed, not my will, but thine be done. And because we are Christians, we follow the example of the Master. So when we're praying, we always remember to ask according to God's will. When we're thinking about when not to pray, the first thing I would say here is to caution you, my sisters. We want to be very careful about assessing in our fallen human hearts that someone is beyond hope. We can read of the danger of this um, in the Holy Scripture. First John, we read that there is a sin that we don't pray for, and it is the sin unto death. And this is something that is wielded a lot these days. A lot of people will accuse other people of having committed this unforgivable sin. The unpardonable sin is written of in the book of Hebrews, but first I want to read to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So if you can turn with me in your Holy King James Bible and read the scriptures along with me, it will greatly bless you, more so than if you're just listening to me. And the reason I know this is when I read the word of God for myself, I have a much greater experience with the Lord. I am closer to him. I understand things in a far deep, deeper way, in a much deeper way. So when we're listening to the word of God, that's good. It's better than nothing. But we have the word of God. And because we have it, we want to be
be blessed by it. And when we read it for ourselves, it gets into us differently. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, let's begin in verse 3. For with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. This is the Apostle Paul speaking here. For I know nothing by myself. The Apostle Paul says here, I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. This is important for us to understand that we are disciples of the Lord Jesus, that we are not God and we cannot see everything that God can see. So we're commanded here in the scripture to judge nothing before the time. And here the word judge is used in the way as coming to a conclusion, making an assessment and a judgment wherein there is no deciding any other way. So basically what it means is when we make up our mind about someone else or about ourselves before the time, and we're commanded not to do that. We are, however, in the scripture commanded to judge righteous judgment, to discern between good and evil. And there's a big difference between discerning good and evil and judging someone before the time, whether it be another person or ourselves. And in the matter of prayer, when people are saying, well, what do I, when do I stop praying for someone? Or, or what is the sin that I don't pray for? The reason I'm cautioning you, cautioning you about this is because that may not be something that you can fairly assess. And there is one who judgeth righteously, and that is Jesus Christ. And he was without sin, and he laid down his innocent life for the sins of mankind while we were yet sinners. So we didn't deserve salvation. We were sinners when Christ died for us. So once we've found salvation and we've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, had our sins remitted, we've received the Holy Ghost, that is not a time for us to now exalt ourselves as judges of who is worthy and who is not. Because the scripture says the word will judge, not us. We will sit on the throne with Jesus Christ and judge the world, but that's for another time. And in this time, there are things that we cannot know, and that's what the scripture says here. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. So that said, we do understand that it is possible for someone to commit a sin that we would not pray for. And we want to understand what that is. So now let's turn to Hebrews chapter, I think it's verse 6. Um, yes, it's verse, I mean chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 6. And let's begin reading here in verse 4. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And then if we just read here, Let's read in verse 8, but, he, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. 
The unpardonable sin is when someone has partaken of the gift. That means they have received the Holy Ghost. They have partaken of the goodness of the kingdom of God. So they are a saint who turns from the truth and the beauty of holiness found in the scripture and has gone back to their old ways. So they have partaken of the heavenly gift and then they have turned back to serve the serpent. That is the unpardonable sin. And there is one very stunning example of this in the Holy Bible when Judas betrayed Jesus Christ. So Judas had partaken of close relationship with the only begotten Son of God. He had known him. He had known him. And he betrayed him. So this spirit of Antichrist can exist in a person when they turn from the way of holiness and become an enemy of God. This is a very serious sin, and it can happen. But there are occasions where someone has partaken of the Holy Spirit and the heavenly gift, and they sin. And that is not the same thing as the unpardonable sin when someone becomes the enemy of Jesus Christ, is hostile to the way of truth, and betrays the brethren. That is the difference. And so we want to be very careful, and I've seen this happen. It grieves my heart when I see it happen. When people say, oh, well, you've, you know, I'm speaking, a Christian might say, I'm speaking to you from the Holy Spirit, and you're telling me that I'm of the devil, and that means that you've committed the unpardonable sin, because that's what the Pharisees said to Jesus. And I want to review this for you, because it's important that we understand. In Matthew, let's read of this story in Matthew. So I believe it's Matthew 12. Hold on just a moment. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, let's read. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow, you're speaking about Jesus Christ, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And then we read... Jesus has quite a lengthy response, but we want to just go now to verse 31. And I do urge you to read this entire passage later. But in verse 31, Jesus says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. So Jesus is specifically referring to when people who have partaken of the kingdom, so these were Pharisees who are well versed in the word of God and their Messiah was standing right in front of them and in him fully dwelled the spirit of his father and they said that the works that he did by the power of the Holy Spirit were done by the power of Satan and this was approaching unto and it may not have been because we read here that, that when someone speaks against the Son of God, that it, it shall be forgiven him. But against the Holy Ghost, it shall not. So they were saying, this fellow is doing this by the power of Satan. And verily, it's a pretty common accusation against God's people to be accused of being a false teacher, a false prophet, being deceived, deceiving people, speaking from a false spirit, and, and that is not, when someone accuses a Christian of that, that is not the unpardonable sin. So I'm asking you to be careful, my sisters, about thinking someone has blasphemed the Holy Ghost because they've spoken a blasphemy against you. 
The blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, when it occurs, is when someone has partaken of the heavenly gift and then renounces that gift and turns back to serve the devil. And they become an accuser of the brethren then, in that particular situation, as Judas did. This is the sin that we don't pray for. And the reason why we don't pray for it is there's no hope. That cannot be forgiven. Once someone has committed that sin, it cannot be repented of, and it will not be forgiven, even in this world or in the next world. So it's a very serious thing, but we are not able in fallen flesh to determine that in most cases. We want to be very, very careful about saying that someone has done that, because if we're incorrect, if we are incorrect about that, then that person might lose hope when hope is, is yet available. There are many, many serious sins that can take place in a Christian that can be forgiven. In particular, I want to read in 1 Corinthians 5. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's read here in verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Of course, this is the instance where someone in the Christian church, in the Corinthian church, was a fornicator and it actually was having relations with his father's wife. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, said that that one should be delivered unto Satan. He was not saying he should be delivered unto hell. He said he should be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You see, when we see someone sin a sin that is not unto death, then we it doesn't mean, when we pray for them, it doesn't mean that we pray for their blessing. It means that we pray that they be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of their flesh, if it's a very serious sin in a Christian. That's what we do. That is what our prayer should be. We would want them to come to repentance. So my sister wrote to me today, and and she she said that people are praying for um, in particular, f for the fires in, in Australia. And all the churches are coming together at a certain time to pray for certain cities, and, and they want God to intervene and take away these fires. But these people, as she so uh, correctly pointed out, these people don't know Jesus Christ. They're yet in their iniquities. They're a rebellious and ungodly people. And they want God to come to the rescue when in fact God is bringing the fires. And the fires are being brought for what? For the destruction of the flesh, so that people might repent. So the way that we pray for sin, it, is, it requires us to, to have wisdom and discernment about what is really happening. In terms of blasphemy, I want to talk about that a little bit because I think people really misunderstand the sin of uh, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit and they confuse it with other kinds of blasphemy. So people might use foul language, particularly when they're unsaved. And they might take the name of the Lord in vain. And this is blasphemy. They might say things about God, about God the Father, who is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, when they, when they don't know him. And that is not the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is when someone turns from the light to serve the darkness, as Judas did. Please turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's read here verse 13. And this is again the Apostle Paul speaking about himself who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious 
but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. One cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit without knowing what they're doing. They have to know the Holy Spirit. They have to know the things of the kingdom. They have to be partakers in order to become uh, someone who has committed the unpardonable sin. Now, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, and he was alive at the time of Jesus Christ. He was alive at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and he actually was a witness to and a partaker in the stoning of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And the reason I'm calling this to your attention is so that we can understand how often people misunderstand the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. So he was a Pharisee. He was someone who was very well educated in the law. He was very familiar with the scripture. And he was alive at the time of the, of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So I want to go to Luke. Let's go to the gospel according to Luke chapter 23 and let's read here the prayer of jesus christ on the cross in verse 34 then said jesus father forgive them for they know not what they do now the pharisees had delivered jesus christ to the authorities to the roman authorities for condemnation and crucifixion. But it was the Pharisees, the religious people, who used their authority to coerce the state authority to crucify the Lord. So we can know that the Pharisees, the Pharisees who accused Jesus Christ of casting out devils by the power of Satan, the Pharisees who plotted with Judas to arrest him and torture him unto death, that they were some of the ones that Jesus Christ was praying for. He was praying for the Roman soldiers, and he was praying for those who had plotted against him. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, some of them knew what they were doing, because not everyone was forgiven. But we see that Jesus Christ prayed for the people who were crucifying him. So when people ask me, well, when do I stop praying for someone? I get a prick in my spirit and I want to caution you. Because even when they were crucifying him, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, prayed for them. Now, was Paul there? Was Paul part of it? His name at that time would have been Saul. Was he there? It's not written that he was. But it is written that he was a blasphemer and a persecutor. It is also written in the book of Acts. So let's go to Acts chapter 7. And let's read in verse, pardon me. I'm going to begin in verse 58. But this is the story of the stoning of Stephen. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. This is the young man that, in a very short period of time after this, became the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, who wrote a good deal of the New Testament. So this young Pharisee, was watching the coats of the people who were murdering the first Christian martyr. So here he is a persecutor. In this story, he's a per persecutor. And in this story, we can see that he's doing harm to God's people. But we do not witness him blaspheming. We do know that, that the Apostle Paul admits to blasphemy in 1 Timothy. So I want to read this again. 
in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. Let's start in verse 12. And I thank God, and I thank Jesus, pardon me, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. Now let's read again the prayer of Jesus Christ on the cross. Luke chapter 24 and verse 20, pardon me, and verse 34, pardon me. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Ignorantly and in unbelief. That's why we want to be very careful about trying to assess whether someone is not worthy of our prayers. Jesus spoke about um, prayer, and there, there were a number of places that he did so, but first I want to clear up a little misunderstanding in 1 John chapter 2. So please turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So here in 1 John, we're commanded to not love the world and the things that are in the world. But this is not a commandment to tell us to not love people, to not love sinners. And we can read of this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And let's read in verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You see, this is what Jesus Christ said, and it's what he did as well. So when he was praying on the cross for the people who were crucifying him, this is exactly what he was doing. He was loving his enemies, blessing them that cursed him. And he wasn't saying, God bless you when he was being crucified. Rather, he prayed for God to forgive them because he knew that they had no idea what they were doing. If they had known what they were doing, they wouldn't have done it. They knew and on some level that they were crucifying the Messiah. Some of them knew that, but they didn't know what it was really that they were doing. They had some idea, but they really didn't know. And for that reason, we can, we can understand that the Apostle Paul, whether he was there or not, he was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees stood against the Lord Jesus Christ. And they also, he also, after the crucifixion, set about to, to destroy God's people and persecute them. And he called himself a blasphemer and a persecutor who did it in ignorance and unbelief. And God used him mightily. So we want to be very careful about saying, well, this or that person, I'm not going to pray for them. They're hopeless. Now, when it comes to the false church, so I've been talking for almost half an hour now, but I'm going to keep going because sometimes a video needs to be a little bit longer so that we can cover the entire topic in one video. So I encourage you to continue to listen because there is much more that is going to be said. 
when we pray for people, do we pray for the false church? Do we pray for these people who call themselves by the name of the Lord, who worship other gods and tack on the name of the Lord onto their false gods, who partake of pagan feasts and festivals, who make excuse for their iniquity, who say to the prophets, prophesy unto me smooth things, and they think that they're God's people. Do we pray for them? Well, let's go to the word of God to determine this. In Jeremiah chapter 7, Jeremiah chapter 7, and let's read here. I want to begin starting in verse 8. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered to do these abominations? You know, if there's ever been a part of the scripture that described the behavior of the false church, this is it. This is it. Because this is what the false church does. They trust in lying words that cannot profit. They trust that all they have to do is believe. They trust that their sinner's prayer has saved them. They trust that inviting Jesus Christ into their heart has saved them. When none of those things are found in the scripture, they ignore the way of salvation and they deny the one true God that Jesus Christ spoke of. And in particular, I might refer you to John chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, where Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, referred to his Father, the Holy Spirit, as the only true God. But the only true God is written of throughout the scripture, and people who worship what is it here? Let's read. After other gods, you burn incense unto Baal. So to burn incense means to pray. So when we pray, we're, we're worshiping God, and that is incense before the throne. So people who pray to their false Jesus, the second person of a triune Godhead known as God the Son, they're they're offering prayers unto a, an idol that doesn't exist. And what stands behind the idol are false gods, Baal. It's Baal worship. So th th these false churches worship Baal and they, they offer their prayers unto a different Jesus. So when they're all standing together in agreement to have this worldwide corporate prayer for the fires in Australia or whatever disaster, the thing is, is that they don't see that these things are coming upon them to bring them to repentance. So do we pray for them? Well, let's read on. I want to go now to verse 13. And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, and I called you, but ye answered not. Let's read in verse 16. Therefore, pray not. Therefore, pray not. The Lord is speaking here to Jeremiah. Therefore, pray not for this people. Ne neither lift up cry nor prayer for them. Neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. So do we pray for people in the false church? Yes and no. So if they persecute us, we pray that the Father forgive them because they don't know what they're doing, which is true. And this is to follow the example of Jesus Christ. We also pray for their flesh to be destroyed, to deliver them unto Satan for the destruction of their flesh, that the spirit might be saved. So we don't pray for the fires to go away. We pray that the fires will bring them to their knees. You see? But we don't intercede for them. We don't say, Father, bless these people. 
We don't say that. We don't say, Father, don't bring these fires, this judgment upon these people, because that's not our business to, to tell God to do that. God's will is being done, and we want to recognize that sometimes his will is not comfortable for us. So when we're praying for these people, we might feel very sad in our heart that they're going to the everlasting fire as well as this particular fire if they die in these fires. You see, we may not be happy about that, but we don't pray that the fire be taken away. We pray that they come to repentance and that the fires be used to bring them to repentance because there are some in the false churches who are doing all of these things, who are doing it in ignorance and in unbelief, as the Apostle Paul committed great and grievous sins in ignorance and unbelief. It's not for us to condemn someone before the time. Now, in terms of our, our prayers, our prayers are very, very precious unto the Lord. And I want to just talk about this for a moment here. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, we are commanded to cast all our cares upon him, for he careth for us. So when we, for example, have family members in the false church, and we love them, and we want them to be saved, and if they're rejecting the word of the Lord, does that mean we don't pray for them? Well, we don't pray for their blessing. We don't pray for them to not suffer from the sins that they're in. Rather, we would pray that the hand of the Lord be heavy upon them so that they can come to repentance. This is the prayer of de delivering such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. It's a righteous prayer. It's according to God's will. It's not according to our fleshly idea of what they need. We're we're on our knees as Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, if it be possible that they not end up in the fire, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. These are the prayers of the righteous. And we do know that the prayers of the righteous are heard. We just read, and I want to go again to First John just to reiterate this, because it's very important to know that God hears our prayers if we are praying according to his will. In verse 14 of 1 John chapter 5, we read, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. He's not going to make it so that the people you love are obedient. But he will make it so that they are clearly deciding. He will be heavy upon their lives. He will bring sometimes great tribulation into their life so that they will come to repentance. And as Christians, we care very little for the, the preservation of the flesh, either our own flesh or anyone's flesh. Rather, our prayers are for their spirit, for their everlasting soul, where they end up, if they end up in the kingdom of heaven for eternity, or if they end up in the lake of fire for eternity. That's what we care about. So when we're praying for people, we want to pray in line with God's will. So if someone is in, for example, the false church, or they're in the world, and, and they're worshiping devils of one kind or the other, and they think themselves to be righteous, we don't pray for their blessing. We pray that the Lord's hand will be heavy on their lives. Now in Psalm 56, let's go to Psalm 56. And let's read here, beginning in verse 8. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord will I praise his word. 
In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. So when we pray before the Lord, we trust him. You see, when we're praying in accordance with his will, we know that whatever then happens will be according to his will. So we place our beloved friends and family who are not in the faith on the throne, before not on the throne, before the throne. We place them on the altar and we say, not my will, Father, but thine be done. But if it be possible, bring them to repentance because they're doing it in ignorance and in unbelief. So the two instances that we don't pray for is one is the unpardonable sin. And what I would say about that is in most cases, that is not for us to determine. So we want to be very careful about making that accusation and seek the Lord about it. And he will direct our prayers. If he directs us not to pray for someone, then we, we can let it go. But if we're not sure, we don't want to just go around condemning people. That's basically the point of that. The second thing that we don't pray for is we don't pray for the blessing of the false church and the willfully disobedient, the people who call themselves by the name of Jesus Christ and are living in hypocrisy and iniquity. We do not pray for those organizations. We don't pray for their blessing. Rather, we pray that they come to repentance. So I hope this matter is cleared up for you. And feel free to ask more questions if there are more, because verily prayer has many different aspects to it. This is just one particular part of our prayer and, and what we and what we recognize as saints that that when we're praying for for sinners, it's different than when we're praying for saints. When we pray for for people to come to repentance, it's different when when we're calling upon the name of the Lord for a sinner who doesn't have salvation yet. And when we're praying for a saint who is slipping away, who is sinning, those are different things. So we want to use wisdom and consult the Lord and his word in every particular situation. And what I would say most of all is that when we have a sincere love for God and we're on our knees before the throne and we're crying out to him and our tears are falling, we can know that he hears our prayer. And as long as we remember that he hears and answers, answers prayers according to his will, if we're willing to submit unto his will, whatever it may be, then we will sow in tears, but we will reap, we will reap in joy. So let us remember that we're not the ones who decide. It's our obligation as Christians to speak the word of God unto people. And if they reject it today, if they reject it tomorrow, that doesn't mean they're going to reject it next Thursday. So again, I remain here for you. If you have further questions, feel free to email me or to comment in the comment section below. And may the word of God go forth today and edify many in Jesus' precious name. Amen.